So I put up a homework uh, last night. Took some time to, to get everything together. I put up the homework last night. Okay. Uh, you can go to the website. It's uh, doughanley.com slash gradgrowth. Uh, let me make sure that it's it's all working up there. Doughanley.com. Um, okay, yeah, it's working there. Uh, let me, we can even pop over the website. There's a website. Uh, so put up, put up that, calling it Battle Royale. There's not really much of a battle, but, but there is a sense in which there's some competition. So I figured why not? Um, but it's friendly competition. So, so yeah. Uh, but here, here's the deal. Okay. I don't know if maybe, I don't know if you guys saw it or not, but it's, it's fine. I put it up fairly recently. Uh, so it's going to be due, I'm going to say, try and make it due on the 13th. So that's like a week, two weeks, I mean, two weeks, less than two weeks, um, a little less than two weeks. I'm flexible on that, right? Uh, we'll just show you, there we go. You're not here for games, but you are here for the Battle Royale. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is, you can, yeah, you know, there's, there, I, I haven't decided what the metric is exactly going to be. It might be a little subjective, but... Uh, maybe I'll get a little bit more formal about the metric maybe um, as, as we progress. But the due date is not hard and fast. I mean, I'll ask you guys next week how you're feeling and then we can see from there. Okay, so, um, but yeah, obviously we, we don't have too much time left in the term, but but I want I want this to be, you know, fruitful at, at the same time. Okay, so um, so let's jump in here, click on the HTML. There's a couple different files involved in this. Okay, so first, this is like, you know, the orders uh, battle royale. So, so basically, what I did was I generate I generated some simulated data from a model. Okay, if, um, it's a model of firms. Okay, and uh, and that's here. Okay, so you can download that here. So it's um, I don't know. It's got it's like fifteen megabytes or so. Uh, I don't think. Well, yeah. I guess if I open it, you won't be able to see it, but. It's data, uh, it's a CSV file, comma separated variable, it's pretty standard. Okay, so, um, and essentially what it has is the, um, uh, each each row is a firm ID and a year. Okay, so it's like annual data and then firm characteristics. So like the revenue for that year, uh, employment, number of employees, the, how much they're paying in terms of wages, um, the, which, Let's, let's say that the wages, we kind of know that the wages are the only cost, there's, there's no capital. Uh, profits, which, which you can compute from that, uh, and then R&D spending, okay? So that's that's what you see uh, at the firm year level, okay? And it's just a flat, you know, long form file. Okay, so um, that's what you get. And then what you do after that is is in some sense up to you, although I'll give you, you know, you'll have some hints on, on what's exactly going on. So. I won't tell you, I'm not going to tell you the exact model. It's going to be some something like cutting courts in Mach 2 that we're going to finish up talking about today. Okay. It's going to be something like that, but you know, you don't get told what the model is in the real world. So I think this is a little bit better to keep some ambiguity, but you, you kind of know that it's in the neighborhood. Okay. Um, so, so then what I'm going to want you to do is kind of code up what you think is a good model or, you know, and you can always tweak it later on as if you, if you find that it's, it's not perfect. Um, and uh, code it up, get the solution, and then um, estimate the parameters of that model. Okay, so then, and and so I guess part of the reason why it's not clear what the the metric is is that, uh, well, uh, you know, you, you might not use the same model that I use to generate the data, and so then it's not clear that we can compare the parameters. Okay, so. Um, one thing actually we could do is I could just generate even more data from the same model, but using a different seed uh, and then see how you do on out of sample prediction things. But that's kind of complicated. So um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Okay. But for now, it's just sort of like see how, how, how we can match it. And then maybe we can try and figure out some, some reasonable metric uh, about that. Okay. So um, yeah, so that's the idea. Uh, your mission should you choose to accept it. Okay. I think you should accept it. So now um, I'm gonna do like a training exercise, just get warmed up, you know, uh, before we go into like the full-fledged 
you know, heterogeneous firm distribution equilibrium. Okay. So what we're going to do first is, is this like neoclassical growth model. All right. This is, um, pretty standard, uh, problem to be solved in macro. Although this is, this is in continuous time. Okay. So you actually do need to, to switch it up, um, a little bit. Okay. So I guess, uh, Let me think. Do you need to? Oh. Yeah, I mean, okay, so here's the thing. In continuous time, it, it's often useful to have, so usually what you do in, in like regular discrete time neoclassical growth is you have output um, and then you you subtract, uh, you, you know, your consumption is your output minus investment and it's linear. So you do some investment and that turns one for one into capital, okay? Here, what I'm going to say is there's a, a an investment cost function, which is convex. Okay, so so what that what that's going to do is is make sure that you always have like an interior solution for investment. Okay, um, yeah, I mean it's it's possible to do in the linear case, but it, this this makes things a little bit more stable. Okay, um, so then that's that's D here. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly go through this model. That's D I. That's saying how much how much do you have to pay to to achieve investment level I. So so. If you, if you think about this as um, a value function, okay, you're gonna have rho v, okay, and v dot will be zero here. Uh, rho v is equal to u of, this is consumption, so output f of k minus investment cost, all right? Uh, plus, so here you're gonna have, uh, Maybe I haven't really gone over this enough to say. Maybe I should. I'll go back and go over this a later on. But um, some of you will will find this familiar. Maybe others will not. Um, the 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 effect, okay, of increasing uh, capital is going to be v sub k times i minus delta k. So this is like the net, this is k dot uh, investment minus depreciation times the the marginal effect of k. Right. So that's how you do this in continuous time. Production function, standard Kappa Douglas. Utility function, standard CRRA. And that'll give you the first order condition. Okay, so the, the, the advantage here is that you get a specific I because D prime of I is some increasing function. Uh, you get a specific I, which is like D prime inverse of VK over UC, E prime C, all right? Uh, you can calculate envelope condition. You can calculate steady state capital uh, and things like that. Okay, so I'll go over this in a little bit more detail, but I'm just gonna give you like the, the major the, the major points here. Okay, so, um, and then I'm, I'm even gonna give you the notebook to solve that. Okay, so it's here. Uh, basically a notebook goes through how to solve neoclassical growth model and get it right um, using continuous time methods. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm gonna come back to this because I. I, I need to talk about some computational stuff that, that we're gonna do here, and so then I need to, uh, I'll come back to this, okay? Um, all right, and then the, the, the main mission here is uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna code up this cut and quartzum style model. Um, I'm gonna have you use a GMM approach, okay? So you're gonna have certain moments, and you're gonna calculate the variance covariance matrix of those moments in the data, because you're gonna have panel data. So if you have like the average um, R and D spending or normalized R and D spending, you can calculate that and you can calculate its variance across the uh, firms and you can calculate, uh, the correlation with that, uh, of that moment with all the other moments and get a, a variance covariance matrix. Okay. Um, then using that, you can do GMM. Okay. Uh, and that, that'll be that. So you get standard error. So that'd be cool. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then if, if you want, you can do maximum, said so you can do maximum likelihood. That's, I've never actually done that, but I think it would be cool. I think it's even possible in this setting. So, you know, that's if you, if you really are feeling super ambitious, but you don't have to do that, okay? Um, all right, so so that's pretty much it, okay? Um, I mean, it's a, it's, a lot, it's a lot of work, okay? Uh, so it's a short statement of the problem, but it's a lot of work, okay? So, and uh, you just do the best you can. Uh, with that, all right. So we'll talk about it as we go on. All right. Um, okay. So that's the homework. I think what I'm going to do here now is is a little bit 
uh, on this this cutting quartum stuff, and then uh, a little bit on computational stuff, and then we can move on to text analysis. Okay, so I don't know. Probably realistically, I'll spend the first half of this lecture doing that, and then uh, second half doing text analysis. Okay, so let's hope we can stick to that. All right. Um, uh, how big should the bear go? Very big. So, uh, I mean, it'll be as big as, I mean, however many moments you have, basically. Okay, so, um, you know, I mean, you should probably have more moments or as many moments as parameters. Okay, that's that's kind of the rule of thumb. You can have more. There's, no, there's nothing necessarily saying you can't have more. Um, yeah, but you should have at least as many as, as parameters. Okay, and then the variance covariance matrix which would be that n squared uh, in the, the number of moments, basically. Okay. Um, I forget how many, the, 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 yeah, there's a lot of firms in this data set. So this is, we shouldn't have too many problems with, with sample size. Okay. All right. So, all right. Yeah, I think that's okay. So, so, so for now, you know, let me know if you have any questions about that, uh, now or later, but, um, that's, that's the plan. Okay, uh, let's see. So, so we want to go. See, and so, oh yeah, and then uh, on the main website, I also have a link to the data battle royale. That's CSV, and uh, the 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 actual Jupiter, you know, IPython notebook with the uh, neoclassical growth implementation. Okay, so I'll I'll come back to that later on. Okay, um, all right, but for now, I think where in the so. Let me just come back to, so, so I'm gonna go over sort of the value function related stuff here. Okay, um, where did? Where did I stop last time? I can't, I can't actually remember. Uh, sorry, I would have done this, but I just finished teaching my other class right before this. Um, so I need to, if you guys remember, um, yeah, quick question, can I? Jupiter, what's the difference between Jupiter Lab and Jupiter Notebook? Good question. Um, so Jupiter Notebook basically is sort of the, the original incarnation, okay? And so like this is, J Jupiter Notebook is just like this area, not really, but like like old Jupiter Notebook was just like this. You'd go to a web page and it would just have this. And then there's like a separate screen where you would browse stuff and then you would click into this on a separate page, okay? At some point, I guess they decided they wanted to, to up their game, okay? And so they created Jupyter Lab. So Jupyter Lab, um, that's got like this browser on the left side, kind of built into everything, and you've got different tabs and this, these menus and stuff, okay? So so Jupyter Lab is like the, the 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 new version, and and honestly, I only use Jupyter Lab now because it's just, it's just way slicker. Like the, the UI is very. It, it doesn't feel like some like rinky dink web UI. It feels like a, a solid real native UI, although it's not because um, it uses this, this, this uh, I don't know, Photon or something like that uh, web, web uh, framework. Okay. So, um, Phosphor, yeah, Phosphor.js, I think it's called. So, um, yeah, that's the basic. I, I would use JupyterLab. It's, it's super, I, I would say it's a big improvement. Um, you can also, you can, um, so like this is, what is this? This is like, well, this, this is just the markdown file with the, you can look at text files. You could look at um, CSV. I'm a little hesitant to, no, oh, fuck it, I'll do it. Um, this, yeah, actually this is good. Yeah, so you can look at CSV files. This is like a 16 megabyte file, but the cool thing is that it only reads as in, in, in uh, if, it, if it needs to see it, right? So there's a lot of rows in this file, um, you know, ten, tens of hundreds of thousands or something like that. But it only it only reads the parts that it needs to see, so it's not going to blow up your computer. If you tried to do this in Excel, there's a good chance it would blow up your computer. Um, so, at least that's my experience. Um, so yeah, that's kind of cool. And here you can see, actually, the uh, this is convenient. You can see the the firm data sets. You have firm ID, year, revenue, employment, wages, R and D, and profit. Okay. Um, I started the years from 1970 to today. It, it's not. I mean just fake years it's that I just decided to make contemporaneous. Okay, so um yeah. Uh so it's kinda I don't know. It's it's super useful. And you can you can edit regular Python files too in it. It has like an editor 
that would look something like this. It's got like code highlighting and everything. This is Markdown, but you can you can do the same thing for for Python files. So you can do everything you want in here. And it, if you had like a server that that you had for some reason, you could access it through here oftentimes and edit files and run stuff. And so it, it's very convenient, um, especially once you start doing stuff remotely. Okay. Um, so so at Pit, you know, uh, we have the Center for Computing and Informatics, new 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 uh, school that contains like CS and everyone else related to that data science stuff. So they have all these supercomputers. So if you guys need to do that, probably won't need it for this class, but if you need to do that at some point, that's an option and, and Jupyter Lab could also be useful to interface with them. I don't know. I don't know. I, I haven't used it, especially with Jupyter Lab, but I think they, they could they could do that. Okay. Um yeah. So yeah, and then in terms of using it, I mean you can use Anaconda that features Jupyter Lab. You can do it um, natively on your computer. That's what I do. You just kind of run it, and it's there. And you can you can go to localhost port here uh, and get that. Okay. Um, let me. One thing I was just gonna do is see like the last moments of last lecture. Where are we at? Twenty seven thirteen. What was the last thing we did? I'm seeing firm value of some kind of advanced Clutton Corton model. Yeah, okay. So we did, yeah, all right, we did some distributions. Okay, so, um, yeah, okay, so we're gonna, we'll, we'll just pick off from there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we basically did the value function. Uh, Jupyter Lab. You can't do import NumPy in Jupyter Lab, but you can do it in Jupyter Notebook. So, this is my anti fouling glove for the record, so I can write stuff in the tablet. Um, it came with the tablet. Uh, yeah, I mean, so it depends on what your setup is. It might be that you're, you know what it probably is. So, in Jupyter Notebook, so Jupiter, so the thing is that Jupiter, um, there's a whole hierarchy of stuff. You've got Python interpreter exists at the bottom. Then you got IPython, which is a shell, which like runs stuff in Python for you, okay, and like remembers your history and things like that. Then you've got um, Jupiter, okay, which is like the cell kind of idea, okay, like the notebook idea, Jupiter notebook, and then you got Jupiter Lab, which is like the superstructure. Okay, uh, but but Jupyter and IPython and all that they they interface with with a Python interpreter and they're different versions of the Python interpreter. So if, if you look up here on the right, it says this is interfacing with a, a, a kernel. So the kernel is like what's running in the background. This is interfacing with a Python three point eight kernel. Now each version of Python they they're a little different. Okay, but it's also true that they have their own package spaces. So you have to install like if you install NumPy in Python three point six but not 3.7, it's not gonna work in 3.7 until you install it for 3.7. That stuff is worked out in Anaconda kind of intelligently, I believe, uh, but you just have to double check that you're in the right environment and you've installed NumPy in that particular environment. And then when you go to Jupyter Lab, you need to check that you're using the right environment here. So here, you know, I have Python 3.8 selected um, and I have everything installed there, but also I have everything installed in 3.6 and 3.7. And I have another one for like TensorFlow stuff, which is because it was being problematic. So um, you can create different ones, but just um, make sure that you're in the right one here and the one that corresponds to the where you've installed stuff in the right in, in the right way. So, so one thing you could do is go to Jupyter Notebook and see what version of Python that's running and then just use the same one in Jupyter Lab and make sure that they're consistent, okay? So that should work and that's probably the issue, okay? Um, cool, yeah, let me know. If you, if you need any more. I mean, uh, yeah, maybe we could do a Zoom. Maybe we should, if you guys want to, yeah, just let me know if you want to talk on Zoom, you know, for this, especially for this technical stuff. Um, that might be useful uh, at any point, okay? Um, okay, so let's let's go back to the, um, the stuff, all right? So we basically, I'll jump on over to the to the whiteboard analog uh, in a minute, but but um, this is lecture two. 
So we, we were we were looking at some variant of this model here, okay? Um, and I think we're, we're looking at a, sort of a slight simplification of, of the model where where alpha was equal to one, okay? Um, but but the, I mean the, 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 the idea there is we want to we want to do these continuous time value functions uh, the in sort of the proper way. Okay, so how are you? How are you? Are you? Are you guys feeling good about like the sort of basic continuous time value functions? How do you? Do you want me to go over some something like that? Like I could go over you know, class, I could go over that neoclassical growth one a little bit just to get get the basic idea. That might actually be useful. Yeah, I'm gonna go. Over, let me. I'm gonna go over that because then we can see some of the computational sort of nuances that are gonna show up there. Okay, there's basically only one trick that you have to make sure that you do, and then you'll be all set. Okay, so let me let me do that. Um, okay, so we're gonna hit up the whiteboard here. Uh, okay, so then this is gonna be this neoclassical growth. Classical growth model. I don't know why it's called this. I mean, I do, but still, it seems a little. It's a lot. It's a lot going on there. Um, okay, so let me let me give you the basic setup here. Uh, so this is like you know this is a, this this is really just like a social planner's problem in essence. Okay, um, so you've got uh, 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 per cat. You know, this is all effectively. You can think about this as per capita, I'm just starting out per capita. So, or you know, it's just one unit of population, right? So y uh, is equal to z of k, this is, this is your production function, f of k, all right? Um, yeah, you have c, okay, is CRA, or I mean, it doesn't really matter, but that's what, I'm, that's what I'm using in the code, okay? And then we have this cost function for uh, investment. Okay, so if you want to achieve rate of investment i, you have to pay gamma i to the n in terms of um, final good. Okay, and then uh, the result is that c is equal to you know whatever you produce minus uh, your investment costs. Okay, um, all right, and so then we want to. Uh, you know, if you if you we want to write down the, the the value function for this, okay? So then what we would do is, um, so I mean, like the yeah, you know, the formal derivation would be like if you want to, if you want to do this in, starting out in small discrete time steps, okay? Then you would say that you know, d of t is equal to delta times u c of t, okay? Or I mean, I should write this. Is f of k, f of k minus d of i, all right, plus um, some discounting. Okay, so I'll use I'll use rho for the discount rate. So the or the you discount, you can just do for for small time steps. You can do one minus uh, rho times delta. This is, this is like approximately equal to you know e to the minus delta rho. Right, so the, the idea is this is an approximation to actual uh, exponential discounting. Okay, so um, right, and then you get your continuation value. Okay, and so your continuate. I guess we don't even need we don't need the brackets. Your continuation value is just where you end up in the next period. So it's going to be like d of t plus delta. So I'm, yeah, you know what? We need we have a state variable here. Can't ignore that. We have k. So this is, this should really be like v of k t. Okay, so this is v of what? It's uh, v of k plus delta times k dot. So it's like i minus delta k, right? So it's saying you invest a certain amount i, that's your rate, and then you get depreciation, delta k, 
delta speciation rate, and then this capital delta is just that time step that it's occurring over, okay? And then we also need the fact that time itself evolves, okay? So nothing's changing uh, exogenously here over time, so that's not gonna really matter that much, but in general, if you were looking at a transition, that would be critical, okay? So, and then the other thing to note is that, um, This, you know, symbolically, this is fine. But if you were doing this computationally, sometimes you might worry about whether um, this thing is positive. Like if delta were for some reason not small enough, this this might go negative, which would be bad. Okay, you could also write this as like one over one plus delta rho. That's still approximately equal to this exponential thing, and it's also guaranteed to be positive and less than one. Okay, so sometimes people use this construction here, and it, it's the same thing because of it's true for small delta, okay? Um, all right, so then here, um, we kind of do the usual thing, which is subtract this one component here over the other side and divide by delta, okay? So we're gonna get V kT minus V uh, K plus delta I minus delta K comma T plus delta. Okay, so it's just moving that right-hand side thing over here and then divide by delta. Okay, so on the left, we have like some kind of derivative thing. And on the right, we're just left with everything that doesn't, that's not gonna like blow up. Okay, so here and then plus, uh, sorry, minus. Minus, and then that, that delta is gonna move over there and cancel, so rho, um, okay. Okay, uh, minus rho, uh, well, yep, I mean, sorry, minus rho times v. I'll write the whole thing out, but it's not going to be important. t plus delta, okay, that v, whatever, okay? So then we're going to say delta goes to zero. What are the implications? So this, this is like a, this is two derivatives happening at once. You could like intelligently add and subtract things, but we can see this is basically gonna be a K derivative and a T derivative at the same time, and it's gonna be linear. Okay, so you're gonna get like minus, and remember the, the, the plus stuff is on the right-hand side rather than the left, so it's everything's gonna be minus. So minus I minus delta K times VK, that derivative partial with respect to K, and then uh, minus the V dot, the, the time derivative from this plus T side, okay? So that's what we're gonna get on the left, those, those two partials picking up the fact that both things are changing with respect to delta. And then on the right, we're gonna get u of f of k minus di uh, minus rho v. Okay, of, I'm, I'm dropping the v of k's, but the, the v is still dependent on k. All right, sorry. Okay. All right, so um, yeah, and then usually but the way people rearrange this is you know you got Rho v minus v dot is equal to u of f of k minus d i uh, plus i minus delta k v k. All right, so kind of like the rho v minus v dot term, full utility, and then something relating to how your state variable is moving around times the partial. Okay, so that's the general, right? That's how we, we make these value functions, okay? And then, uh, yeah, and then the or I investment is actually being chosen optimally. Okay, so your your first order condition. Um, it's a, okay, sorry, I thought the message. Okay, everyone's good. Okay, uh, your first order condition is going to be well, basically, you know, something coming from this di term here versus vk. All right, so you're like your FOC is going to be you know zero equals what? It's minus u prime of c times d prime of i plus this i derivative is just going to give you a vk, which means u prime of c times d prime of i is equal to v sub k. Right, so that's your that's your first order condition here. 
So this should be, you know, I think we've seen stuff like this before. Basically, we got a value function or a first order condition. Now, um, kind of work, getting the steady state can be tricky sometimes because to do that, you need to use the envelope condition, all right? Um, it works a little bit differently in continuous time. So think about the envelope condition here. So we're taking the derivative. Um, let's see. I mean, I'm going to assert that, you know, there's nothing changing over time. So that V dot should be zero. So if we're looking for a steady state, yeah, it should be, we can just drop V dot. That's not going anywhere. Okay. So really do like this. Okay. So then, um, what does our envelope condition look like? Well, it's going to be rho vk z equal to what? Uh, so it's going to be this derivative. I guess I can write fc uh, with respect to k. So f prime of k times u of c, u prime of c. Okay. Uh, plus, we're going to get this derivative. Now, remember... There with respect to I, any derivative with respect to I or optimizing variable doesn't show up because it's going to drop out with our envelope condition logic. Okay, so the like this derivative here is minus delta. So the derivative of the first would be just minus delta with respect to k times vk plus this first vkk. Okay, so this is our envelope condition in general. Right, but usually what we do for the envelope condition is we uh, evaluate it at steady state. So steady state in envelope condition, meaning k dot equals zero, which means that i is equal to delta k. Right. So remember, you know, k dot is equal to i minus delta k. Right. So. Um, so that's going to simplify things, right? Because then we get, you know, rho vk. Uh, or really, so we, we can combine these into rho plus delta times vk. Rho plus delta times vk. This thing's going to be zero, right? This is this is k dot equals zero. So this thing drops. That's a good thing because we don't know what vkk is, right? That's the whole beauty of it. And then f prime of k, u prime of c. Okay, so in the, in the end, we get like a relatively simple statement there. Okay, um, cool. So then we can combine these. Uh, won't, we won't, we don't differentiate V dot for envelope condition. So you could, um, so for the envelope condition, if you did that, you would just, you would get a minus V dot sub K. You'd get the cross derivative there. Okay, um, and then yeah, so I mean, it's if you had that, you you even if you assume steady state, okay, you, it might be that uh, that's changing, okay. Um, I guess let me think. Yeah, it's not trivial. I think um, you really you really need to assume stationarity here uh, to get this. Just to get any action on the steady state, basically, but but in general, yeah, I mean, you could you could include this in the uh, uh, in the envelope condition, and and maybe that would be useful. But but for finding steady state, we need to assume that kind of we don't have any movement in the aggregate, and uh, the uh, that we're at steady state, right? So um, yeah, so so if we do that, so so what we can do is say, okay, well, th this means that basically, um, yep, uh, so. This means that f prime of k times u prime of c over rho plus delta is equal to vk right from here. And then from here, we also know that that's equal to u prime of c z prime of i, okay, from our first order condition. All right, so this is equal to that. Good thing is these u prime c is cancel, okay? And so we just get f prime of k over rho plus delta is equal to d prime of i. Okay. 
Um, yeah, so that's our, and this is this is K star, this is K star, and then I star, I guess. We know that I star is equal to delta K star, right? Because this is zero, okay? So this is an equation characterizing K star, okay? And it doesn't even involve utility for whatever reason, okay? So it's just, a, it only involves production function and the, the uh, investment cost function, okay? So the cool thing is we can we can get we can get k star right you know, we have to solve some nonlinear equation but it's actually you, you can solve it analytically for a specific functional forms okay so it's not it's not bad at all um, and uh, yeah and if you want to think about what would that look like it's actually you got you got if you, if you have a not a condition on your production, the left hand side looks like that. If you have uh, strictly convex uh, cost function, the right hand side, not like quite like that, but more like this. Let's see if we can do this. It's gonna look like that. Okay, so you're gonna have a unique positive intersection point there, you know, as long as you got these standard convexity concavity assumptions. Okay, for this for this equation here. All right. So we got a, we got ourselves a K star. Um, and that's that's actually useful. okay, it's good to know in general. Um, but it's also useful useful computationally is, is what we'll see. okay. All right so so that's the theory. okay, that's pretty much as far as we can go on theory. All right. So now let's think about computation. Right. Um, it's kind of funny how it works out. Uh, we go out through all this work to get things in continuous time, okay? But actually, at, at the end of the day, when we do computation, we discretize it. We rediscretize it, okay? Um, so the you know continuous time does have benefits with regards to reducing combinatorial issues and, and state space issues um, like that, uh, but. You know, you kind of have to discretize it at the end of the day. Okay, so so what we're gonna do is take give me this take take that equation at the top up here. Okay, and we're gonna re-discretize that, which is to say we're actually gonna go back to this equation here. Basically, yeah, we're gonna go, we're gonna go back to this equation here. Okay. So we're going to say uh, V of K is equal to delta U of F of K minus V of I. We're going to use the computationally safe 1 over 1 plus delta rho formulation. Okay. And then uh, V of K plus delta times I minus other delta k and we're gonna we're gonna assume stationarity no time dependence at all okay so that's our rediscretized equation okay the first order condition is the same the first order condition is uh u prime of c v prime of i is equal to um v sub k all right but then v sub k well what's v sub k that's that's complicated all right, that's that's going to be a discrete um, derivative or a finite difference derivative, which is to say rise over run on the grid. Okay, um, so we're gonna we're gonna compute that. So so this and you know I'm writing this like a function, but you know there, there's there's a there's a k grid. So k is in you know. K zero, K one, up to, up all the way to Kn. Okay, so there's there's just a K grid. Okay, um, and then we're we're computing it on that grid. Okay, so so there's a couple things that issues that are going to come up. Okay, so first you know we can as a real you you really can write like I don't know 
let's 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 use superscript for the grid point. So it's a it's a V of I, uh, you know, corresponds to. Okay, I already did that. Okay. Um, well, you know, we we can we can mostly figure that. So it's like V V sub I corresponds to um, the value function evaluated at k sub i. Okay, that's that's the notation. We we need to use v k for the derivative, but I'll I don't know, I'll figure it out. Um, okay, so that's that's going to be that's going to be on a grid. Okay, and so then the first thing you run into um, is if you want to evaluate this equation, right? You know, it's like v. Uh, you know, you want to you want to you want to do like value function iteration. Okay, so you've got a vk, uh, v you know vector guess, okay, which is like, you know this this whole vector of value function evaluated at these k's. You've got a guess for that, say zero, or actually what usually you can do like j or something. Guess number j, okay, and you want to update that, all right. So you can evaluate production there. You know, you, what we're going to actually do is you'll have a guess i for investment as well, and you just do both at, at the same time. So you got to guess. So you, you you can calculate di fk, you can calculate utility, everything like that. That's fine, um, but then you have to interpolate this because this isn't given an i and a k. This this is not guaranteed to be on a grid, so you need to you need to interpolate that. Okay, so you need to interpolate. Uh, v of k continuation. All right. Um, this this continuation value here. Okay. You got to interpolate that. That's um, not too bad. Uh, so that's uh, yeah. So there's a sci-fi dot interp okay and in particular you can use interp 1d okay so there's a built-in function in sci-fi which does interpolation pretty easily we'll see that um in the code all right um so that's actually not so bad um the, the tough part is is getting vk uh you know the vector for iteration j okay um so essentially you can think about um so so like one one option which is like the I'll call it like the high high derivative okay or the upper derivative I don't know um is you look at uh so 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 let's see this is where we have the issue of like vk i with j let's 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 drop j okay we don't need to worry about j right now so v v derivative with respect to k at grid point i okay you could have that be uh um vk I plus one minus VK I over K I plus one minus K I right rise over run okay but you're going up from from I okay so this would be like plus okay and then the the low derivative uh, would be VK I is uh, VK I minus VK I minus one over ki minus ki minus one. So that's where you look down, okay, for the derivative. They're both valid, you could, I mean, you could even do a center one. But in this case, we're gonna do it like this. There's a high derivative and a lower derivative, an upper and a lower derivative. Let's call it upper and lower derivative, okay? So, um, yes, we're gonna call this upper and lower, okay? Um, Right, so you can you can calculate either of those. There's, there doesn't appear to be any difference ex ante, right? Um, but it turns out, for various reasons, uh, 
you need to be careful with this, okay? And actually what you're gonna do is, is some combination of these depending on where you are in the grid, okay? And essentially, the idea is you wanna, you wanna use the derivative in the direction that k dot is looking like at that time, okay? So remember, so k dot is i minus delta k. So at any, at any given iteration, you have a guess for i for the investment, okay? Where we, where our, our guesses are v and i. Okay, we have guesses for those on grid, all right? Any, any given iteration, you've got a guess for k dot because you've got a guess for i and you know the k grid, okay? Um, okay, and what you're gonna do, some, essentially what you're gonna do is uh, you're gonna use v plus if k is positive. So it's, it's kind of like, okay, well, you know, k dot is positive, you're gonna be going up and so you should reference the upper direction for uh, your derivative, okay? Which is to say like, if you're below a steady state where k dot equals zero, uh, you're looking up, you're gonna go towards steady state and you're gonna link yourself to that basically. You're, if you think about it, you're emanating from steady state, so you're gonna link yourself to that. Um, and then you're gonna use v minus if k dot is less than zero. So if you're, you're, you're above steady state, k dot is negative, you're gonna look downwards towards steady state. You're, you're basically always looking towards steady state. And so if you think about these equations as linked together, you're, you're, you're anchored on steady state, okay? Because steady state is like a, it's stable, it's self-referential. You can find the value at steady state even without doing any of this because you know you're never going anywhere, right? The value at steady state is super easy to find because you know that you're never moving around. And we actually know, we know steady state, right? We could plug in, we could, we could find V sub K, or we could plug in for all of this and find V at steady state, right? So that's a, that's a, that's a super easy thing to get, relatively speaking, okay? Um, and so for that reason, it's stable, it, it's not going anywhere. We, we are anchoring all these other points to it iteratively by pointing the derivatives in the right direction, okay? Now at steady state for this one, you know, it doesn't matter if you use V plus or V minus, okay? So then, um, <clears throat> yeah, so then, so then like V, V K, so here, here we're saying v, v sub K, right? This is the derivative. Uh, v sub K is, I'm gonna write it in like full on, you know, LaTeX mode. Uh, the plus, the upper derivative, um, this is basically the same, but why not? The same, but with worse handwriting. Um, and the, the lower derivative, if okay, that's negative and it doesn't matter in between. Okay, so I just write it like this. Put less than greater than or equal to. Okay, so that's what we do for, you know, but th this, this is for a given guess, right? Um, but it, it's fine, okay? Um, Okay, now that's that's one thing you do. The the more advanced thing is to say that uh, take think about this um, sigmoid function. So the sigmoid function is gonna look like that. Not really that, but something like that. Okay, uh, which is which is like the normal. CDF, okay, so it's like zero, passes through a half, okay, and then it goes up to one, zero. Well, okay, so some kind of sigmoid function, right? Um, and use that instead of this, what's called a, I think, heavy side function, which is like a zero, one step function. Essentially, this is like steps from, from minus to plus at zero, okay? So instead, you're gonna say that, and th so you're gonna make it continuous. You're gonna say that V of K is equal to the sigmoid thing, K dot. So, so if K dot is really large, this is gonna be one. So if it's really large, then we're gonna be in V plus space. Okay, and then plus one minus sigmoid K dot uh, V minus. So if K dot is negative, super negative, then this thing is zero. So we're gonna pick up V minus. You got a super positive, we're gonna pick up V plus. Sigmoid what now? Sigmoid. 
M. Uh, it's um. This is the normal CDF. Okay, it's uh at zero. Sorry, at minus infinity. At zero, at plus infinity, it's one, and then it has a continuous sort of thing, and then in the middle it does this sort of like adoption curve sort of thing. Okay, so it, it increasing derivative, maximal derivative at zero, or it crosses a half, and then decreases. Okay, so um, now in, in in so what that's going to do is so like doing this cutoff thing is essentially like this. It's like if our sigmoid was infinitely steep, what we're just going to do is smooth it out. Okay. Uh, why is k dot in sigmoid? That's that's what's determining this. Remember, right? So. Um, that you know, if uh, if k dot is positive, here we want to use the, the the upper derivative, so we're pointing towards steady state. If k dot is negative, we're going down. We want to use the lower derivative, so we're pointing towards steady state. Okay, so um, let's see. I guess you could also instead of using k dot as the the the, the decider, you could use like k minus k star whether you're above or below steady state. So at the true solution, these should be similar, right? If you're, I mean, technically to be 100% correct, we should use k star minus k. So um, at the true solution, if you're below steady state, then k dot should be positive. And so so these should line up. And then if k dot, if you're above steady state, k dot should be negative. So this, this would be negative here. Okay. so. I think you could use either one. I usually use k dot because that's sort of like more self-corrective, but maybe maybe it's better to use the other one. I, I, I need to check that out. Okay. But but the reason we're using k dot is that we want to be we want to reference steady state. We want to point towards steady state. Essentially it's like if the grid point right below steady state uses the upper derivative, it's referencing steady state. Which means if we knew steady state, we could then back out what the one right below it is with the derivative. Okay, they're linked. Okay, and then you can iteratively do that from steady state. So you're chaining things away from steady state. That's the whole idea. Um, and so you know, maybe in some sense it would be better to do this. Uh, we have sigma distribution by assumption. Uh, so so you know what? Any it, any any so when I say when I say sigma sigma is a general notion of something that looks like this. Okay, so examples of sigmoids are. Normal CDF is one, okay? Another one is the, the logistic function, so that would be like one over one plus e to the minus x. As x goes to minus infinity, this goes to infinity and hence goes to zero and vice versa. Wait, so it's a con yeah, it's a continuous transform. Yeah, so um, yeah. So that's also true, right, in terms of like what we're putting into it, but then it's like, yeah, it's it's the 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 functional form is the, the idea of a sigmoid function is, a, is just a general function of something that looks kind of like this, okay? Um, so the, the, the two main, ex the two usual examples are, are that. I, you could also use, uh, or no, actually, yeah, th that's, the, that's the main example is the logistic form, which is one over one plus e to the minus x, okay? Um, now, the, the other thing, which, which I haven't mentioned is how steep is this, right? So re really, You'd want to throw on like another, you know, factor. Like I don't know, what's a good what's a good letter? I think I, I don't remember what I called it, like kappa or something. No, that's not a good that's not good with kappa. We don't want it. We don't want to do that. Uh, just just throw in beta or something, right? So you want to throw in a coefficient here. When you throw in a coefficient here, that makes it steeper. Right. If you make the if if the coefficient is larger than one, it makes it steeper. As beta goes to infinity, it approaches this step function or the so-called heavy side function. Okay, and as beta gets closer to zero, it's going to just approach a straight line. It's going to be it's going to take really really long time to, to get to zero and to one. Okay, so the this the, the the bigger you make beta, the closer you get to the heavy side function. But if, let's say you make it like kind of big, like ten or something, then it's going to be still continuous, which is good. It's good to preserve continuity. Um, but it's, uh, it's not going to be crazy steep, but it's not, and it's not going to be like crazy shallow. Okay. So that's like a tuning parameter kind of, I mean, it's not always clear what the best value to use is. Okay. But, um, yeah, I just, 
I've been using 10 and it works pretty well, okay? But it depends on how big you expect KDAT to be. So, um, fill up my mic here. So, yeah, so that that's how you that's how you construct this derivative term in such a way that it's sort of continuous, but also is making everything reference steady state, which is sort of a stable point, which is, well, it's kind of weird because we know the state we know the steady state is like, in some sense, unstable, but but we're actually kind of doing it in reverse, and we know that in reverse the steady state is stable, so it's fine. Um, Okay, so those are the two big things. Interpolation, which is relatively straightforward. You just use the interp function. And then intelligent derivating, okay? Uh, sometimes it's called winding, the winding scheme, okay? Of where you're pointing based on where you are in the space. That's what like, it's like Ben Mola does a lot of stuff. It's the so-called like Hank literature or like Hank model where they have like heterogeneous agent new Keynesian stuff and you can solve it super quick. This is similar to that. And what their, their main trick is, is that you have this winding scheme uh, that makes things stable. Okay. So that's, that's the basic idea. If you try, if you do the winding thing wrong, things will blow up. Okay. It's not just like, Oh, you should do this. It's like that they will blow up if, if you do it sufficiently wrong. Okay. Um, Yeah. The other thing is like, you know, when you do these, like if you, if you got a value function, okay. Say the value function looks like this. Okay. When, when you're at the end of your grid points and you, and you want, let's say you want to do the upper derivative on the right side here. Well, it's not really, you can't do the upper derivative. Okay. So we, what you actually do is if you want to, get a value there, you have to like use the lower derivative and just copy it. Okay. And then here you can use like the lower derivative, the upper derivative and copy it. Okay. So, um, you're essentially extrapolating. So you, you generally don't want to use those. So the cool thing is that, you know, when you're at the high side of your grid, your, your grid space, you should be, your, your K dot should be negative, right? You, you want to, you want to have your steady state like in the middle here. So you should get up, K dot should be negative here. So you're always going to be using the lower one anyway. And down here, K dash should be positive. You're always going to be using the upper one. So you're always referencing steady state, okay? And for that reason, it's like when we solved this with backwards in time, where you, where you, where you start at steady state and go backwards. It's kind of like that, okay? I know it looks like I'm pointing towards steady state, but it's, it's actually kind of like you're referencing this, so it's, it's sort of backwards, okay? That's the idea. Um, okay, if you do that, then you'll be all set, all right? I guarantee um, now let's, let's jump into kind of implementation. Okay. Uh, head over to the, the browser region here, specifically the Jupyter hub region. Okay. So here, um, what do we got? Uh, so standard stuff, importing things, numpy, scipy, matplotlib. So you got interp1d, that's the interpolation function. Uh, xbit, this is like our sigmoid function. This is, uh, what is it? Let me just restart. xbit, what is x? It's, it's the logistic sigmoid. Actually, this, this, the one I'm using is one over one plus e to the minus x. So if you, if you wanna see what does this look like, what does this sigmoid function look like? Let's go from minus two to two with a hundred grid points. Okay, that's all well and good, but maybe we should just um, be smart about this. Uh, so let's say x equals that, and then we're plotting x versus x bit x. Okay, so, well, that doesn't get very far, okay? But you can see if you go to 10, 10 to 10, then we get that sigmoid shape. That's that's a classic sigmoid shape. It's symmetric, passes through half at zero, uh, it goes from zero to one. Okay, that's all we really need. Uh, it's continuous. Okay, and then you can see if I threw on a factor of 100 here, then it looks like the heavy side function. Okay, nearly. Um, so that's 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 the basic idea behind our sigmoid function. Um, that's called xbit. That's just one. In that's the one I found in SciPy. So why not? Um, and then F solve is for getting the, uh, uh, steady state value. I could have solved it symbolically 
with specific functional forms, but I figured I may, may as well make it a little bit more general. Okay, so okay, so that's good. And now um, let's go through some of the the factors that are going to show up here. Okay, so one really important thing is the number of grid points you have. Okay, I don't know, a hundred seemed good, so I did it. I don't actually think there are huge advantages to choosing powers of two these days, especially when you're only dealing with something like a hundred, but maybe there is. Um, iterations, you got value function iteration and you keep iterating until it converges, but you need to set a maximum or you should set a maximum in case it doesn't work. So I set 20,000. Um, Del T, that's important. That's your time step. Okay, remember we're, we are re-discretizing these equations. Okay, so you need some time step. Point one works. Uh, updating for value functions, you don't always want to update exactly to the, the next iteration. You want to kind of go in that direction. So I'm saying you do half stay where you are and you half go to the new spot. Okay, that's point five. Convergent tolerance, such as when is your value function iteration process done? CFs, minimal consumption value. So the thing is that we are evaluating um, utility and uh, marginal utility, and those are unnotified. Um, so uh, you don't want to accidentally just in the course of your initial iterations on VFI, you maybe you try something negative or really low. You want to bound those away from zero. So I'm saying you can't have consumption below one and minus six. Okay. You, it doesn't really matter. It just needs to be something small. Um, output, this is how often you output statistics. Sig fact, sigmoid factor. That's the steepness. That's our, what I call beta. That's how steep the, the sigmoid is. Okay. Uh, I chose 50. I don't know. It seems to work well. And then uh, the the grid range, this thing, like in proportion to the steady state, how how big should you make the grid? So you should basically make the grid around steady state. Okay, this is just saying fractionally how how big should you make it? Okay, those are algorithm parameters. Okay, um, let me just restart just because those are algorithm parameters. Uh, model parameters: rho, discount rate, delta, depreciation rate, alpha, Cobb Douglas parameter, theta, CRA parameter. I'm going to do two. Gamma, so now you have the investment cost has a, a, a scale and a, and a curvature. So 10 scale, 2.5 curvature. I don't know, anything goes there. Uh, and then TFP, I just threw in, but I'm sending it equal to one. Okay, so those are standard uh, macro parameters. Okay, so now here you can you can write stuff out symbolically using specific functional forms, but I just said, well, I'll just make a, a utility function function, uh, utility function function junction, uh, and that's what the cell is, and um, just define that so I can change it later. Let's say I decided I wanted to do CARA instead of CRA, I could just do that, okay? So, um, yeah, so here I implement that minimum, right? So C bounded is the minimum, the maximum of C F and C, and then I have a special, for CRA, you, you need to do a special case. If theta is one, you do log, otherwise you do whatever the CRA formula is, okay? Then the derivative is just that thing to the minus theta. Uh, same for production function. Production function, derivative. I guess maybe I should, you could bound that, you could bound it at zero in case you're worried about that, but usually, no, you don't really need to need because you're only evaluating the production function on grid and you know that the grid is positive, okay? Um, cost function. Yeah, cost function, you can bound it. Again, I, I don't know, you don't probably need to, but I did just because I'm paranoid. Okay, so, so I just define these as Python functions that I can use later. So now when I do the finding steady state, I have a function which uh, encodes that equation that characterized steady state. So we calculate I, Y, the, the F prime, VK, you know, all that stuff, and then just find the difference, and then we can solve that. Okay, so um, did I actually run this stuff? Let's see, let me share. Okay, so run it, and then it finds steady state is 1.65. That's a very simple operation. Then we create our grid, okay, fractionally around steady state, okay. We can pre-compute some stuff. In this case, it's just output. So output is always evaluated on grid. So it's just y values are the production function evaluated on the k grid. So here, you know, note that in, in NumPy land, you can do everything vectorized. So even though I wrote this function completely unaware in principle that whether it was taking a scalar or a vector, it, it works either way. So I'm calling in this on the vector of k grid. I don't need to worry about looping or anything like that. Okay. The only looping I'm doing is is VFI looping. Okay. Um, okay. Then uh, then we need to do initial guesses. Initial guesses. I don't know anything. So here, what I did was just took the utility that you'd get if you 
consumed all the output and divided by rho. So that's kind of kind of an upper bound on what you could expect in some sense, right? Um, well, maybe not. I don't know. So it's, it's something approximating a not bad first guess, okay? And then for investment, I just said zero, okay? Which would actually be what, um, well, you'd have depreciation too, but it, it, it's not a bad first guess either. Okay, so you just stay where you are. Um, okay, and then you go through and actually do the VFI. Okay, so what you need to do is, so, so remember that the guess structure here is you have a guess for the value function and investment at the same time, and you update those both in tandem. Okay, so you could um, you could start with the guess for the value function, and then uh, IVALS is our initial guess for the policy function. That's correct. Yep, that's our initial guess for our policy, which is the investment function. So you could you could just guess value function, and then do the discrete derivative first, and then solve for your first order condition, first order equation. So let me go to NCG. Uh, so you, you you could solve for the the first order condition here. Okay, the problem is that like. First of all, i is actually inside c. Remember, c is f of k minus d of i, right? So that this is a non-trivial equation, and it kind of could jump around. It could be annoying. If you take c as given, then we know for sure that there's just one i that satisfies this because d prime is monotonically increasing because because d is strictly convex. Uh, so it's easier to take c as given. But to take c as given, you need to know i. So that's why we have an i guess floating around. Okay, so this gets back to the that notion of of like the rigidity of the system which is like, instead of making everything depend on everything else and only having one variable, like it's sometimes better to have multiple variables that you guess and slowly update them all individually, okay? So here we take I as given as a guess, calculate the cost, calculate consumption, calculate utility, okay? Which actually, oh no, that's, that's the derivative. Calculate utility, which is our flow value. Calculate K diff, which is, the, which is K dot, really. Um, here, which is I minus delta K. Okay, so we get all that conditional on knowing the guess for I, we can get we can get the flow value and K dot, okay? Now, th that's all sort of symbolically true. Okay, now this is like the interpolation. So now we're saying, okay, well, on the, gr on the, for the, for the actual discretization, the next K is where we are today, K grid. So K grid is just the K values on grid plus del T or, or time step times K dot. Okay, so remember when you go to actual like discretized, you just, you multiply del T times K dot and that's how much you're gonna move in the discretized version, okay? And so K next is just that, okay? And then what we're doing is, is uh, so we're using terp one D. So in terp one, this is a little bit of a weird interface, but basically for the terp one D, you give it your interpolation points. So you give it the K grid and the current guess for the value function, okay? And what this does is constructs a function which will evaluate other points, and it'll accept vectors. And also we're telling it to extrapolate in case we, we should go beyond the uh, uh, bounds. In, once we get close to convergence, we should not be doing that, but maybe in the inner, before we converge, we might accidentally do that. So that's why, you, that's why you'd wanna extrapolate. I don't think that's critical though. Um, so this constructs that function and then you evaluate it at k next. So where you think you're gonna be next, you get those interpolations and this is all vectorized, okay? And then this is just implementing that discretized value function. So you say the, the, the update, which I'm calling v prime for some reason, the update for uh, the value function is del t times the flow value, which you've computed, times, and this is the, the safe discounter, one over one plus uh, delta rho. Uh, times the continuation value v next. Okay, so this is basically exactly what we had symbolically before. Okay, now, um, now we have we have the update for v actually already. Okay, and we just we used the guess for i and the guess for v to get it. Now, um, now it's for the derivative. Okay, so this is the the, the critical part. So first, what we do is, so if you have an n size grid uh, with n value function values guesses, you can you can do so. Diff just takes the cumulative differences, like the difference from point to point. So if you if you do the diff approach, you're gonna get n minus one values. 
Okay, that's that's the thing about like you know you, you, for an n size grid you only really get n minus one values and they're sort of central. Okay, so then to get to low one, you duplicate the first entry and then and then have the whole vector. So so you have n minus one, you just duplicate that first one. Okay, so then, um, so that so so that so like remember when when we drew, uh, this picture here. Can you see that? I think you should be able to see that, but it's it's like going through another window. But I think you should be able to see that. So when we drew this here, um. Or even, where was it? Maybe not. Okay. Um, yeah. So we, we drew this. If, if you're, if you're on the low side, okay. You're you're looking up. Uh, you're looking downwards. Okay. So so you repeat the first one because that's the one that goes beyond the grid bounds. Okay. So the zero one would be like this here, and then the real zero would be like this one, the next the next one. Okay. So you're but you're basically repeating the first one because you need to repeat something. That's what this is. So you use the zeroth entry and then put the whole vector after that. So the low is you do that. For the high one, you, you put the whole vector down and you repeat the last one. Okay. So the hope is you never actually reference those. Okay. Um, we got a question here. Uh, the, this whole part is because we can't computationally take a directional derivative, so we have to approximate it. Um, yeah. So I mean, in some sense, this is a directional derivative. Well. Yeah, you know, there's not there's there's not much to be said for directional derivatives here because we're only in one dimension. Um so so our direction is is binary, I guess. Um but yeah, we want to go in the right direction, essentially. Yeah. Um if we were if we were in multiple dimensions, then well, a good thing is in continuous time you don't have to worry about multiple dimensions. You really you you only move in one dimension at a time, and if you if you want to take a directional derivative, essentially you just take a linear combination, which is which is I guess how directional derivatives work. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, so I think that's I mean yeah, it's related to direct, directional derivatives. I don't know what to say exactly in one dimension, but it's it's it, you know in some sense there is a direction of, of just up or down. Yeah. So, um, okay, so we we do that. We we construct the low and the high derivatives. We construct our sigmoid. Okay, we just do it once. Okay, so we take k dot times that factor and then put it through the sigmoid function, okay? And then we use that to weight. So that we have sigmoid, uh, sorry, I am pointing at something which you can't see. But here you can see we take the sigmoid and uh, multiply it by k, uh, v, v k high or dv and dv low. Okay, so let me, so uh, here you can see, you know, construct these functions, construct the sigmoid and then, uh, you know, wait, do the linear combination for, for the sigmoid, we, we assign dv high, and for the inverse of that, we assign dv low, okay? So this should be a continuous thing. I mean, it should look okay. It's just, it's it's pointing in the right direction. So this is our final, you know, actual dv estimate, okay? Um, now the only thing we have to do is, we, the reason we need a dv is because we need to get i out of that first order condition, okay? So what this is doing is taking that dv or v sub k estimate okay and then plug and then looking at the solved first order uh, equation okay so the first order equation remember it was was this thing here so we're solving like we we have vk we have u prime of c we just did that and we're just looking at like you know divide to v, vk over u prime of c and then like invert this thing okay that's what we're doing so here we're saying d, dk here divided by u prime of c uh and then invert it all right, so, um, yeah, so that gives us an I update, okay? And at that point, we're done. I mean, all we have to do is is calculate the error differences. So we're saying, what's the mean absolute deviation between our original guess and our new guess, both for V and for I, and then we just take the max over those two. This is like our full-on error. If if our guesses were the same as our, uh, our updates were the same as our guesses for both, this this would be zero. Okay, and it has to be positive and it would be zero if they were the same. And if we look for convergence, I'm using one times 10 to the minus 12. And then here, after, so first we check the error and then we update, right? Remember, that's important. And then after you check the error, you update. And so here we're saying, okay, take update weight times the new one and then the one minus update weight times the original. So we're just going going a little bit halfway in the, in the direction of the update. That's all for stability. That's usually necessary to some extent. Okay, 
run this, boom, takes takes nine thousand steps. That's 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 a lot. So one thing is that there's a speed stability trade off generally. Okay, um, there's a speed stability trade off, and if you choose higher updates, higher higher update weights, it's gonna go faster, but it might go off the rails. You could choose bigger delta k. It's probably gonna go faster, but it also again might go off the rails if things get too wild. All right, so there's usually a speed stability trade off for, for a couple of these parameters. Now, let's try to visualize. So what I'm visual now remember all this stuff that we computed, we're updating all of this stuff every iteration, okay? But then once we converge, it's still sticking around, okay? Because it's, it's not in any scope, it's just in this for loop. So all that stuff we can still access in the in this setup, okay? So um, here I'm looking at kdef, that's k dot actually. Well, I call it kdef, k dot. Um, we're gonna plot k dot with uh, across k grid. Now it should be that this crosses zero at what we had previously, like analytically essentially calculated as the steady state. If our, if our computation is correct, that should be the case. And it should be positive below and negative above, okay? And indeed, you know, you plot the blue line is, is k dot as we computed it. This black dot here is KSS that we analytically got. And this is just a zero line, okay? So everything looks good. You can plot other stuff, okay? Maybe as a diagnostic, you know, you want to plot um, k grid versus uh, that sigmoid just to see if it's like not too steep or too shallow. And here you can see it's like, you know, you want to get like like a kind of a sigmoid shape. If, if it looks super flat or too steep, maybe adjust your steepness parameter, but this looks reasonable. Okay, so at the edges, it's using almost exclusively the, uh, the, the proper derivative and it's continuous in the middle, okay? So yeah. Um, that's pretty much it for doing neoclassical growth and you know, it's pretty fast um, and everything like that. So yeah, now going to Cladin Cortum Mach 2. Performance heterogeneity. Yeah. Um, so in the, so th this, this problem is, is, is simple be because there's no shock or anything like that. Right. Um, you just start a decay and you eventually converge to steady state for the, for the cladic quartum, um, there, you know, uh, let's pop back in the notes. So there you only have to track Q hat, Q hat. All we have is Q hat. So eventually we, you know, for the, for this one, right. Um, we get it down to Q hat and you're choosing Z with the first order condition. So it's kind of analogous. It's just a little bit more complicated. Um, this Y probably shouldn't be there. It seems like a thing that shouldn't be there. I'll fix that. Um, yeah, so so we only we only need to track Q hat, right? Now, now this is more interesting because it is true that like, so you, you get creatively destroyed periodically with tau, right? So for, from the conditional on not being creatively destroyed, it's actually very deterministic. You're just going along. You started a Q hat and either you go up or you go down and you, you go where you go. Eventually you get destroyed and that's it. Okay, so that's true. So things are still kind of like simple and then that's actually what makes it tractable because they get reset for the firm, from, from an individual firm's perspective, they get reset uh, when they get destroyed and that's it, they're done. So, um, but then the cool thing is that you still get a distribution over Q hats across products, even though they're going across different firms. Um, and that, yeah, so then you have a non-trivial distribution. Whereas whereas in, in the neoclassical growth model, if you had a bunch of people that started in different Ks, they would just converge to K star and that's it after a while if you generate distribution. Um, but here you, you actually have things bouncing around in, a, in an interesting way, okay? So you're gonna get a Q distribution, Q hat distribution. You're gonna get an N distribution, okay? You can compute them the, 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 the marginals, or not the marginals, you can put the, the total distributions of Q hat and N separately, but then the joint distribution you need to simulate because they are gonna be correlated because firms with high N tend to have products that they acquired recently and those will have higher Q hat values on average. So they are correlated, but you can compute them independently. Okay, so, um, yeah. Mm. Okay, so that's 
that's how we do that. Um, in terms of looking at this, so so um, let's say when you do Agari, the Tauken method with seventy trying to draw as a labor endowment. Uh, kind of quite, we don't. I mean, there's no there's no randomness for the firm. In some sense, they go along doing the thing deterministically. They so they start at some Q hat. They just deterministically move in the space of Q hat, and at some point they get blown up. That's it, for a, for a particular product line. The firms have multiple product lines, but they just think about things at the product line level because it's cutting court them, and so they're basically deterministic with one final shock that just blows them up, and so it doesn't matter. I mean, it matters, but it doesn't like it's not complicated, All right? So there's no you don't have to integrate over over these idiosyncratic draws. Okay, now if you did. Have let's say you had a Brownian motion. What is the optimal way? To, let, let's let's wait on that, Yu Chung. Okay, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves, right? So let, let's talk about the this, this, and then we'll we'll move into simulation, and then uh, and then estimation. Okay, uh, but we'll we'll definitely get there eventually. Okay, um, so uh, yeah, so if you did have idiosyncratic um, movements in, let's say Q hat, let's just say Q hat randomly jumps around or maybe the z's the way the way you would invest in z there's a there's a random multiplicative component okay that, that your innovation is good it works but it's it's random okay so there you'd have to integrate okay so in continue in, in symbolic continuous time it, you'd probably make it look like a, a brownian motion okay and then but then you would discretize it and to discretize it you'd draw little random normals and integrate over those just like with Tauken. And there, yeah, you could, you would probably use something like a Tauken uh, quadrature method. Okay. Uh, but you could use other ones, right? So, um, that would probably, yeah, but you know, remember this, this value function is only at the product line level. Okay. This is for one product line. The firm, remember we, we, drew, we wrote down This is product. Okay, so let's go back up. This, this still applies. Remember, we wrote down this firm value function VN for for the whole firm, but then we we realized that you can break it up into a per product line value function little v, and then we we characterize that. Okay, so this is this is regular cutting quartum, and then this is you know Mach two cutting quartum, blah 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 blah. Eventually, like something like this, you get a similar looking thing. So this is only per product line, but that's enough to characterize their innovation activity because it, it all scales up and down with product lines. Okay, so um, yeah, um, that's how it works. There's, let's see, what should we do? So yeah, getting back to the, the, the randomness, you could do it. You could do it even in this setting. You could you could basically do it. It would be it would be more complicated. You'd have to to for each of those token points, you'd have to ex, you'd have to interpolate and then integrate, and that's that's a little bit more costly. But you could do it. Right? Um, okay. So 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 let's let's take a break now. After the break, I'm gonna, I'll talk a little bit more about um, finding the distributions. Okay, because I think that's something we probably have people haven't done as much of um, compared to the other stuff. Uh, and then maybe maybe a little bit about um, simulation, and and Yu Chung's question about the optimal weighting matrix. Okay, so yeah, let's let's break for for ten. So let's come back at at uh, four forty. Okay, I'll see you then. Hey, I'm back. Um, so. Hope everyone's still rocking. All right. Um, okay. Uh, so here's what we're gonna do. Hopefully we can, we can finish up this stuff and then we can get into text analysis. Okay. Um, but uh, if we pop over to the slides, not the whiteboard, the slides. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can see the, the whole derivation here. 
Um, it, it's a little bit more complicated with the way that thing, like the Q stuff is moving around, but basically analogous. Okay, um, you get like a final uh, value function, you get a first order condition, you can calculate an envelope condition which characterizes um, the Q value, which is like a steady state Q where you're not gonna be moving around, okay? Because the thing about Q hat is that you're pushing, you're trying to push it up with uh, your own innovation, your internal innovation, but it's getting pushed down because Q, capital Q is growing on the, in the denominator. So there's gonna be a point where you're just treading water, okay? And that's Q bar, okay? So you can characterize that in the same way that we characterized steady state capital um, and then go on from there, okay? Um, yeah, there's a bunch of other stuff. So, so the the only the only thing I want to talk about is 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 um the uh, the distributional stuff. Okay. So here, let's pop over to the whiteboard and uh, talk about some distributions. That was weird. Okay. There we go. This is not, why did I write whiteboard? We're gonna talk about distributions. Okay, and in particular for Q hat. Okay, so um, what I, so it's a Q hat. What I wrote there in the in the notes, okay, so if you go back to the notes, um, that's for this general formulation, right? So the, the, the general formulation we had was um, that what was the general formulation for for the for external innovation was this basically okay so the Q the next when you when you get a, do an innovation um, you you get Q plus lambda your step size times some Cobb Douglas aggregator of your own in your own productivity and like average productivity okay so you're like so you're, you're spillovers from different products, blah, blah, blah. So if Q equals, sorry, if beta equals one, that's the standard case where Q prime, is, Q prime equals Q times one plus lambda. That's what you usually do. That's a fixed step size. Um, and you can see that like here, like when beta equals one, this is Q hat goes to one plus lambda. That's pretty easy. Now, um, when you start doing the spillover stuff, then it gets more complicated, but but essentially you just, when, when you have the spillover stuff, then your, um, your growth rate gets, bigger for the lower your Q value is because you're building on everyone else who's higher. Okay, and vice versa. Um, as you get really good relative to the average, your growth rate goes down because you're building on stuff that's really not that good. Okay, so um, that creates more, that, that, that pulls in the distribution. Okay, where beta equals one, you're just, it's more of a random walk. Everything keeps going outwards proportionally. Think about it in log space. With a with a fixed step size in log space, it's it's basically a sort of asymmetric random walk, which is problematic. Um, this pulls it in. Okay, this means that higher Qs have lower growth rates, and and it's going to pull it in. Okay, that can be an issue. Distribution existence is a real problem. Okay, uh, and there are methods of of pulling things in like that, right? By 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 creating these types of setups. Okay, um, I'm gonna I'm actually going to go over the case, the simpler case where. Uh, in fact, beta does equal one because it's just a, it's it's easier. Okay, so so Q prime to so Q times one plus lambda. So when you, when you innovate, you increment it by a factor of one plus lambda. That's what we're going to assume for now. Okay, um, then it's it's also true that because you know because Q hat is equal to Q over capital Q, it's also true that this is the case with uh, Q hat, right? Um, and then. Uh, yep, yeah. and the other thing is the internal innovation is also going to do stuff, okay? Um, so there, we had that GZ, which was the, the internal innovation. Internal. Um, this is like you're, when you have the product line and you're, you're changing your Z around over time. Okay, so then that means that like um, the, the growth rate of Q hat is gonna be 
bz minus g. Okay, because you're pushing up your own q, but then still q bar, or sorry, capital q, you're pushing up your own q at rate gz, but then this is coming down, this is pushing it down at rate g. So it's the, actually the net of these two. Okay, so that's that's all we really need to know is that you're moving around continuously at gz minus g, which could be positive or negative. Okay, um, and then so occasionally you get these these external uh, bumps. Okay, now when that happens, the the ownership of the product line changes hands, but the the Q we don't really care who owns it. Okay, all we care about is that it's going up or down. Okay, so um, yeah, so then the you know if you think about the uh, f you know f of Q hat. Okay, what's what's um, so. Yeah, so I, I'm going to write this in a stationary sense. Okay, so this is this is saying um, we're looking for a stationary, a steady state distribution. If you want to write it on stationary, you're going to pick up a derivative, but I'm just going to write it for stationary. So if we're, if we're in a steady state, it should be that the the fraction of product lines that are lower than q hat. Okay, should be um, okay. Maybe I'm maybe I'm going to confuse myself if I don't write times. Okay, so let's let's write t at time t. Let's say plus delta. So so when you write Distributions. Distributions are backwards from value functions. Value functions, it's v of t equals something something v of t plus delta. Here, indeed, you cannot. Um, so thanks. Uh, so um, let me let me. What I was saying is so so we know that this is the that increment that one plus lambda increment for q, which is also true for q hat. And then we also we can see that the growth rate of q hat is g z minus g. Okay. So. Um, if you look here, uh, uh, the, the reason that the distributions are backwards is that we're saying, okay, now the distribution at time t plus delta is going to be a function of the one at time t plus whatever dynamics happen in the interim. Okay, so value functions are forward-looking, distributions are in some sense backwards-looking. Okay, that's that's one thing. Um, that's like, that actually has some weird, uh, weird, some useful implications in like a Hank style setup or even in this this, this setting. Okay, so. What's it gonna look like? So it's gonna look like f of q sort of where you started. Okay, now stuff can happen. Either people can, people, product lines can flow in from either above or below. Okay, uh, or uh, they can jump out from from this lambda style shock. That, that, because remember we're looking at a CDF that's so below q hat. So um, let's let's think about let let's let's think about as if this was negative that things were flowing down in or jumping out. Okay, um, it'll still work even if it's not, but it's easy to think about when you do it like that. Okay, so let's think about this thing as as being negative. Let's just say like maybe gz is relatively small. Okay, so um, if that's negative, then you're gonna get uh, well actually. Okay, so the, I mean, that's negative. Okay, you know, think about some distribution. Okay, uh, we're at a point here in the distribution Q hat. Um, so there's going to be some range here that's going to like flow over here. Okay, um, and that range is going to be like f of. Uh, The way you can write it is f of q hat times one plus uh, g g not q g z minus g okay times delta that ends that and that ends that okay to be clear f is the CDF that's right f is f is the CDF of, of q hat yep so this is the CDF at the next time step. It's gonna be CDF at current time step. Plus, so this is saying, this is like Q hat with an additional growth rate of GZ minus G. Now you have to put the delta on the growth rate and then do like one plus. Okay, so like this and then minus F of Q hat. Okay, so this is saying, this is that additional flow. You can already see that this Q hat here is gonna cancel this one. So we could have just written this in the first place, but it's that additional flow term which we're gonna call positive, but it could actually be negative. If this if this was negative, then this whole thing would be negative, so it's fine. Um, 
plus, actually rather minus, uh, tau. Remember tau is the rate of, of that lambda shock happening, creative destruction rate. Tau times, this one is saying, okay, anyone in between q hat and q hat over one plus lambda, you have some probability of jumping over here. Okay, now if you, if you were down here, you just jump internally, right? If you were up here, you don't count. Okay, so you're gonna get f of q hat minus f of q hat over one plus lambda. Okay. All right, so this this is like the, the discretized uh, delta of the, of the Poisson flow right there. So we're going delta. Okay, so minus delta t, and then boom. So uh, yeah. Um, what what can we do? So let's let's do the, the usual. We're gonna shuffle things around and divide by uh, uh, t or by delta. Okay. Uh, so these these are gonna cancel, right here. These cancel just immediately. Move this one over here. Okay, and then. That should be equal to tau, so let's divide by delta, and that's going to be equal to tau times this differential. That didn't work. Let's try it again. Okay, so I'm going to shuffle this term over and divide by delta. You're going to get this, okay? So the, the right hand side is already already what it is okay now this hand this side so, so this is like two this is so this should be like comma t actually the, these these should have t's technically t t yeah okay so there's two things going on here one is a is a t derivative so f dot of q hat we'll drop the t's right now um and then the other is a q derivative in the minus direction so it's going to be minus What do you think? Should it be minus? Yeah, it should be minus. Um, it should be minus F Q hat. Okay. The, 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 the Q hat portion of this derivative well, you're gonna get a f f q hat, which is we can we we can write just lowercase f. That's the PDF um, q hat. But then we also need to to pick up this from the chain rule. Okay, so we're gonna pick up g z minus g, and we're actually gonna pick up a q hat from that chain rule. Right? Because remember that if whatever is attached to delta here, one is attached to delta here. Q hat g z minus g is attached to delta. So from the chain rule, we pick that up. Okay, so we get that, and that's equal to tau f of q hat minus f of q hat over one plus lambda. So, all right, now we're going to assume stationarity, which means that f you, you you could use this as a you know f dot equals blah 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 and use that to update this over time. Okay, um, but in in a stationary setting or a steady state setting, then we're gonna get what? So this is a minus, let's just flip that. So we get G minus GZ Q hat F of Q hat is equal to tau times this lambda differential. Okay, so, um, that's how things bounce out. I mean, you can see, even if, like, let's imagine GZ was zero, so you just had this dynamic where things fall down from Q hat growing, so Q, capital Q growing over time, and then they jump up periodically. So it's just like this kind of thing, right? That, um, that actually wouldn't have a, that would not have a uh, <clears throat> stationary distribution because you'd get infinite divergence, okay? Because some would, some would shrink and some would grow. And that's actually basically a binary walk in, in log space and just binary, yeah, a, a random walk in, in log space and you'd get infinite divergence. Um, if you if you threw in that kind of 
beta factor here that would that would curb that tendency and then also you can have another beta factor on gz where the this the lower q hat products grow faster because they build off of others then you're going to be able to, to make it have a stationary representation okay so um yeah uh now what to do about computing this so to compute it um you can you can use this basically this equation right so you can you know you can say f dot is equal to this and minus that okay so that that's an equation describing the evolution right and you just keep iterating that forward until that converges to something okay so you you take an initial guess compute this differential that's easy to compute you have to um, interpolate this though because it's not necessarily on grid um, and then discrete derivative same way as we usually do it okay but you you need to be careful of the direction. I can't remember what the direction is, but it's, there's one direction that's good. Okay, just choose, try both, see what works. Um, do the same thing, kind of winding scheme thing here. Plug all this in, compute the update. Keep doing that until it converges, basically. Okay, so that can be a little tricky, but you, you can get it right. Um, that's the basic idea. So, yeah, so I think that's, that. I mean, I it's the kind of thing you want to give it a shot and then come back with me and questions if you have them. Okay, so I give it a shot. Let's see what happens. Okay. Um, yep. Mm, I think that's kind of all I want to talk about with regards to to Mach two Claudia and Cortum. You're gonna you're gonna. Yep. You'll you'll see all the nitty gritty details when you start implementing it. Okay. Um, the only thing in terms of implementation, I do have kind of a template that I use um, for, for this kind of estimation stuff, which I could, which I actually, I have it on my GitHub. Um, I forget what it's called though. It's like GitHub, uh, like econlib or something. I just think I'll, uh, so we have continuous time. Oh, that's my, oh yeah. Oh yeah, I forgot to talk about estimation. Okay, I'll talk about that too. So I have, okay, I, I have something called econ lib on my GitHub, econ lib lib. Um, I need to update it though. I'll update it with my most recent stuff and then you can, if you want to check that out, you can do that. I'll, I'll update it after class, okay? Um, yeah, so uh, let me talk about estimation. So you've got, we got some questions there. Um, all right, so so first, actually, there's also a simulation. Okay. Um, okay. So so first simulation. Okay, with regards to simulation, right? Um, the way you want to do this. So so in general, what's the state of a firm? It's n, and also a, a length n vector q hat. So like q hat q u vec f and n f. Okay, so so you got a number of products for a firm, and Q hat is the 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 vector of productivities for all of those, right? I guess Q hat really vector, um, and like you know, so you, you know, you you gain some at rate x, you lose them at rate tau, really really n, you know n x. Uh, and x and tau, okay. Um, this is getting out of control. Okay, you, get, you gain products at rate n x, you lose them at rate n tau. You can simulate that, okay. And then the q's, the q hats are kind of they're 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 going around at rate up or down at growth rate g z minus g, which is a this is a function of q hat right itself, okay. So so you know how stuff is moving around now. The problem is that like, it's kind of hard because, especially the Q hat vector here, you don't know how many firms, how many products the firm has. You don't even know what the max is. In, in, in principle, the max is infinite, right? So um, you either have to set a max 
and just waste a lot of memory storing zeros for most firms, which are relatively small. Like you said, the max of 50, like most firms are way smaller. So you just have a ton of zeros that you're wasting. The other thing you can do is set up like a product vector, okay? Where you have like, for each entry, it represents one product and you, you put in the ID of the firm there, okay? For whatever firms, okay? So like here, like firm 10 has like two products and everyone else has one product, okay? Uh, so, so you track those and then you simulate, uh, since everything happens at the product line level, you can simulate like, okay, this product gets creatively destructed, boom. And what you do is you give it to a random other product. So that means that 10 has twice the probability of getting it as does five and all the others. And so it, it has the same dynamics of, of, of you get new products in proportion to your N and you lose them in proportion to your N, right? So it's, it's kind of cool because you only need a vector of like, let's say you make it like 10,000 and you just simulate that at the product line level. And at the end, you add them up and you say, okay, well, it turns out that N10 is two and like N5 is one, right? And so on and so on. And you can back that up. So that that's a good way to do it for this is to have a product vector that you simulate on and just exploit the fact that everything happens at the product level. Then you'd have a Q vector saying, oh, this this one is, is you know, Q hat is 1.2. This one, Q hat is 1.7, 1.8, you know, 0 0.1 and so on. Okay, so you have a Q hat vector and you have like an F firm ID vector. Okay, both like representing products and then everything works, okay? Let's talk about estimation. Okay, if you got, you, the simulation will come later, right? You're not gonna be doing that for some time. So so let's give that a shot and then, and then come at me with questions later on, okay? But estimation I think is important to know. So. So, con so first of all, continuous time, yeah, so in continuous time, uh, you know, delta x is equal to delta times x dot. So if the derivative, I mean, approximately, if the derivative is a certain value, the change over a one it's what you know, let's let's say your 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 delta is denominated in years. If delta then is one, the change over a one year period is just the derivative. Okay, uh, if the, if if you if you're looking for approximately over a two year period, the the change is the derivative times two. If you're looking for monthly, it's a derivative times one twelfth. Okay, so just decide on your units. You don't really have to decide on your units, right? So you know in the code, I use delta equals zero point one. Okay. So then if I wanted to, if I compute stuff, okay, and I want to calculate um, so, so uh, this is the delta I use in the code. If I want to calculate a yearly change, then I mean, I, I still just um, use x dot, okay? So and it kind of sounds kind of like I'm cheating there, but really what it matters is is what are your units okay and then what is what units are ex what things are expressed in Remember, like think about like the interest rate what is the interest rate i mean the interest rate is how much return you get on a stock um over a year period or maybe like continuously compounded over a year period so um how you bring in the data per annum yeah so how you bring in the data will determine your units so if you bring in the data and say that the interest rate is 5% and like that's actually what it is per annum, that determines your time scale. And then if you're looking at like, what's the growth rate of a firm, right? That's, if you look over a year and you use that in your estimation, that's what your bottom is gonna match. Okay, so so you, you wanna be careful about like, what are your units of time, okay? Usually people do quarterly or yearly. Um, I have year in the data, right? So everything basically for you in the data is, is, is per annum, okay? Um, that's what determines things, okay? And so if you use a, a yearly uh, interest rate and everything else yearly, and then you compute your model, when you get, when you compute an X dot in the model, it's gonna be yearly, and you need to scale it up or down depending on what you're looking for, okay? So that's the basic idea. Um, you know, when you're doing simulations, you know, you're gonna have like a tau, right? 
And so the, the probabilities, you, let's say you choose delta 0.1, right? So your probabilities are gonna be like delta tau over that time period, okay? Um, and so then, but then to get that up to your yearly period in the data, you need to run through 10 model simulation periods because delta is 0.1 to get a year, okay? And getting more granularity can be good there because it's a little bit more accurate, okay? So having, you know, running 10 with delta D equals 0.1 can be more accurate than running one with delta T equal to one, okay? So, um, yeah, so that's that's kind of how you simulate and, and set time scales. Um, and then in terms of, okay, the optimal weighting matrix, I mean, it's in Hayashi. Uh, basically, the optimal weighting matrix is the inverse of the variance covariance matrix of the data, the, the moment vector, okay? Um, and then how you use, how, how you calculate standard errors from that, that, you know, reference Hayashi, uh, but the, the optimal weighting matrix itself, yeah, it's just like, it's sigma inverse or whatever. Okay, so, um, like W hat. So you're gonna, I'm gonna have you try both. Try try the, the uniform one and the optimal. I, I'm curious to see what the difference is, okay? Um, the other thing you do is like, if you, yeah, if you like, you can also do it from the, the, the model side. So you use some initial W0, generate some moments and look at their variance covariance matrix or something simulated um, and then generate another one. Like I, there's a way of doing that, okay? Um, but you have to do like sort of this bootstrapping sort of W1, W2 and so on until it converges. That's more complicated. I, I would just use the, the one from the data, okay? Um, all right. Okay, so let's, let's leave it at that for now, okay? I think we can, you know, by next week, you'll be more ready to talk about simulation and estimation stuff, okay? Um, and probably model stuff, like solving stuff. So you'll be more ready to talk about everything. Um, so, so let's leave it at that now and kind of move on, all right? And we can, we can pick it up again next week to, to discuss some more detail. Um, Delta, in the, so you, you can use in the, the Delta T you, you use for solving the model can be anything. You just have to make sure that like, if you choose delta t, delta to be 0.1, that you run for 10 periods if you, if you wanna output a, a yearly. Like if you, if you simulate with delta equals 0.1, you wanna take every 10th period if you're looking for, for yearly data. That's the critical thing, okay? You can choose whatever delta you want as long, I mean, you should choose less than the, the period you're looking for and it should be like a, a multiple so that you can like run it. It should be an integer fraction of the, the year that you're looking for, but other than that, it, it's fine. Okay, so, um, yeah. Okay, so let's let's do let's let's start on text analysis. Okay, um, and then at the end, if you if you, I'll stick around. Okay, I, I'm happy to talk at the end. But let's let's start on text analysis, and then at the end, after class like officially ends, and if you want to talk more, I'm happy to do that too. Okay. Um, all right, so here, what we got. Okay, so I'm gonna pull up some slides here. Uh, text analysis, local, all right, okay. Okay, so I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start talking about text analysis. All right, this is like um, this is like a methods kind of thing. Um, this class is grad what on your website? It's grad growth growth. Yeah, so it's technically.com slash grad growth. Let's see if that works. That works. Okay, yeah, grad growth underscore. Um, okay, so actually these slides. These slides exist on the internet, I think. Yeah, so so I'm gonna go over some slides um, that are there. 
Also on my website that I made up a while back. Okay, um, but they're still good. They're still correct. Yep. Um, this this is if you want to go here for the, these slides. Okay, so uh, we're gonna do like a brief intro here, and then um, if we have time, go over. Um, we probably won't have. We might have time. Uh, go over like a, a notebook with this stuff. Okay, and then and then we can go from there. And then we'll pick it up next time. Either way. All right. So text analysis methods. Um, these are useful. Okay, there's a lot of text out there, and it, you know it's meaningful. Um, <clears throat> and we want to know like how do we extract insights from this, or at least how do we how do we make metrics that we can plug into Stata later on? Okay. Um, I don't actually do the step of plugging it into Stata because I just use Python. But like you know, in general, how do we how do we bring this from this large unruly mass of, of words into something that we as economists can are kind of more comfortable working with? Okay, and then putting it into our analyses. All right. Um, okay, so I'm gonna get, this is this is very very descriptive here, but um, okay. So but here here's the basic idea. Of what we're gonna do? Okay, the main approach to uh, text analysis that people use is what's called document vectorization, okay? Um, and essentially what this does is it takes, yeah, so it takes a sentence or a document. Okay, here when I say document, I could mean a sentence, I could mean uh, an article, I could mean an entire book, doesn't matter, okay? A um, bunch of words. Um, it might not even, it could even be more abstract than words, okay? This is applicable to a wide variety of settings. Uh, so here's saying the quick brown fox jumped over the brown dog. Okay, I switched it out because I wanted to have repeats of words. So here, what you do is you ignore the order of the text. You complete, it's called bag of words approach. You take the words, put them in a bag, shake it up, right? So you ignore the order of the text, the words, and you just count how many instances of each word there are, okay? Document. The document is a, a series of words, like a book or a Wikipedia article or a patent or a song lyrics, things like that. So then the, the, but the approach is document vectorization. So you're turning it into a vector. Okay. Um, so, uh, what, so we're going to just count up the number of instances of each word. So if you do it for this sentence, the word the appears twice, the word quick appears once, the word brown appears twice, and then basically everything appears once. And then I also included some zeros of words that don't matter, that don't appear in this document, uh, such as lazy, plum, and house, okay? Document, I don't understand. Um, what are you, are we seeing the same thing here? Oh my God, I did the same thing again, I forgot that. Okay, so in fact, it doesn't matter that you didn't see the previous step, but this is important. Okay, so document vectorization, now you can actually see it and so, should be should be more clear so so we're turning documents into numerical vectors okay so um so the one example sentence that I'm, that I'm proposing is the quick brown fox jumped over the brown dog so this is an example document yeah document vectorization yeah um so this is an example uh uh document which is quite short compared to the generally what we'll be thinking about um and more so we're just vectorizing about counting up the number of words but ignoring the word order Okay, so 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 this is, you know, so you're losing information because you ignore the the um, the order of words. Okay, but um, you you can extend this, and, and include phrases. So you could look at all pairs of words. Okay, the quick brown fox brown fox fox jumped blah blah blah. Um, in this case, it maybe like brown dog makes sense or brown fox. But you know, if you thought about like for example the term itself, document vectorization, that has meaning over and above simply document and vectorization. It's like a specific thing, okay? So, um, or value function iteration has meaning over and above the three individual words, okay? And that's a, that's a case where it's like, individually you might not know exactly what that means, but then combined it's like, oh, at least as economists we recognize that as a thing, okay? So um, you can do this, you can do this for a bunch of stuff. Um, so in general, the this you can call a word. You can call it a word as literally a word. You can call things tokens. So tokens are like 
a, a unit of analysis in a document. So a token generally could be like an n-gram. So it could be like um, one length phrases, two word length phrases, three word length phrases. phrases. So like a three gram would be value function iteration, okay? And you can think about like the set of all three grams that show up in the document and so on, okay? So Google has this n-gram viewer where you can, and it's linked here, um, where you can search for the historical usage of certain n-grams. So here I'm using proper names, okay? But you could use other stuff like value function iteration. Um, and this just shows like how often do these um, appear in books, okay? So here, th this is like not books by Albert Einstein, but it's like books mentioning Albert Einstein or Frankenstein or Sherlock Holmes, okay? So you can see the, the frequency of these things being mentioned. This, this looks at books historically back to 1800. Um, specifically, but you could do this for any sort of analysis of, of a corpus. Okay. So yeah. Um, yeah. And so then the one thing is that like most words are boring. Most words are the, and, or for, you know, of, so, so the, the vast majority of words are, are not interesting. Okay. And so one danger here is that we're, we're mostly putting most of our weight on words that just are not that interesting, okay? So you can look at, um, this is from Wikipedia, you can look at the cumulative uh, just share of um, words. So here it's saying, take the most common word, which is the, um, that accounts for about, uh, I think 3% of words overall in Wikipedia. Yeah, we usually, we're gonna strip out, either strip out or downweight heavily boring words, yep. Right, so, um, so take so this. The, you can already see that, like maybe you can see the takes like three percent. Okay, and then you add like and and all those other ones. Like even getting to the first few words, you already get around like fifteen percent of words. Okay, if you get up to the hundred most common words, you account for about thirty-three percent. Okay, third, uh, and then the, up to five hundred, you almost get to fifty percent. Okay, and this this is the five hundred most common words. Any all the interesting concepts you've ever considered probably are way way over on the right. Okay, so we want to kind of downweight all this stuff, right? Um, okay, so we or or ignore them entirely. Okay, so we can do that. All right, uh, one thing you can do is called uh, frequency normalization. It's a, the 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 usual term is document frequency. Total frequency inverse document frequency. Okay, so what you do is, you, for a given word, you look at the fraction of documents that it appears in. Okay, so the is gonna have appear in almost every single document. It, it, for instance, amongst like um, patents or Wikipedia articles, they all contain the. Okay, so for for the, you're gonna see f of k being close to one. Okay or perhaps let's say close to one, maybe not exactly one, okay? And so then you're gonna, and but then for doc, you know, value function iteration, that's gonna be like one times 10 to the minus five, okay? So um, what you're gonna do is, is put a weight on the on that vector elements, okay? Which we'll talk about how that exactly factors in later, but you're basically gonna weight that count by the inverse of the frequency. Now, if you do it with the, I'm sorry, if you do it with the and value function iteration with, with just the one over F weighting, you're gonna weight this value function iteration by a factor of a million compared to one for the. That may be a, a bit extreme, okay? So one thing you can also do is just take the log, okay? So what this would do is say for the, this would basically be zero, okay? Which is fine. Um, and then for value function iteration, it'd be the log of, of one e to one times 10 to the six. I don't know, it's like six over log 10 or something. I don't know, it's like, yeah. It's like, let's say it's on the order of five or 10, okay? So you'd weight it up, but not by an insane amount, okay? That's the basic idea, sublinear weighting, okay? So that's that's one approach, okay? We'll see how that manifests itself in a minute, okay? Um, in fact, we'll see it right now. Uh, so so how, how do these weights factor in? So you, so you take the original integer vector, okay? And you throw in those weights, so for each position, you know what the weight is and you just multiply that on there and that creates a new vector. Okay. So, um, you know, going back, remember this, this vector we had, so th this includes, um, stuff that shows up in this particular document includes stuff that doesn't. Okay. Deciding on what this vector, the length of this vector and what each element corresponds to is called deciding on vo your vocabulary. You want to decide what words will you entertain? 
it may be that you want to just not have the as a word that you entertain. You just ignore it. Okay. That's probably not a bad thing to do. And you just look at the more interesting ones. Okay. So, um, or you could do this waiting thing and just make sure that the gets a relatively low weight and that would be fine too. Um, so yeah, so that's going to, that what you decide for your vocabulary determines this vector and you're going to go through and add these weights. Okay. Now, once you have the vector, whether it's weighted or unweighted, okay, you want to have an ability to compare two documents. Okay. And so what you do is you take, you take those two vectors, right? And first, okay. Well, the, the way, the, the way they have it here with C, okay. The, let's say we have either the weighted or unweighted vectors. Okay. You just multiply them together. Okay. And then you divide by their norms. Okay. And so what's that, what that's going to do is give you a zero one, uh, metric for similarity. Okay. So if it's the case that the documents have no words in common whatsoever, when you multiply the vectors together, they're going to, it's going to spit out zero. And the fact that you divide by the norms doesn't matter. It's still zero. Okay. So if there's no overlap in words whatsoever, you get a zero similarity. If it's the case that the documents have the exact same words in terms of fractions, I mean, let's say you took one document that had some, the, the Gettysburg address, and then another document had the Gettysburg address, you'd get the exact same document vectors. When you multiplied them together, you'd actually get the square of the norm. Okay. This would give you the square of the norm. And since they're the same, this is actually just the, the square of the norm as well. So you get one. Okay. So if, if you take Gettysburg address, multiply it with itself, you get one. If it was a Gettysburg address and the Gettysburg address repeated twice, that would be quite the rhetorical flourish on the part of Abraham Lincoln, uh, would just give you the fraction. The documents would be multiples of one another. The, the, the vectors would be multiples of one another. And you can actually show you, you'd also get one. Okay. So if they're multiples of each other, they have the same word frequencies and hence they, this also gives you a one. Okay. So, um, yeah, this, this this gives you a zero one metric basically, and and it's it, the it's it's called cosine similarity because if you thought about these as vectors, let's say in two dimensional space, and you just like projected them out. I don't know how to do this. Obviously, my, my spatial reasoning is not good. But if you if you project them out like this, that angle, this is gonna pick up that angle, okay? But like normalized somehow, okay? So it's like the yeah, actually it's the cosine of the angle. Um, so to give you the cosine of the angle, uh, which is, which is monotonic, right? Uh, between zero and, and 90. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, and then, yeah, in higher dimensional spaces, you know, these are going to be million dimensional spaces. So it's hard for us to imagine that in like a standard three dimensional space world, but yeah, it's still the cosine technically. Okay. So, um, Right, so that's that's similarity. We, now we know we take two documents, vectorize, weight, cosine, similarity, and we can we can say our, how similar are they. Now, this is pretty good. Okay, so um, it works pretty well. You know, like, people have done different studies, both in CS and elsewhere, looking at how well how this works. So you're ignoring the word order, so that might be a worry. Okay, you you can you can look at how like do documents that have similar, similar high similarity scores actually appear to be in terms of meaning, have similar meaning. If you do it with patents um, and you ask like subject matter experts, are they similar technologies? They work pretty, th this similarity metric works pretty well. Okay. Um, don't pay attention to the person who visualize and much. All right, there we, we have a million dimensional being <clears throat> in the chat right now. It's playing, you know, at least 500,000 dimensional chess. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to. I don't want to downplay you guys' spatial reasoning. Okay, I mean, I'm I'm still trying to to orient think vectors according to the to my camera, but I, I yeah, any, the sky's the limit here. Okay, um, okay, so right, this 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 you know you know how to multiply vectors. So that was we don't need to go through that. I was giving examples. Okay, so so that's that's similarity. All right, um, the other thing you can do is you may want to cluster documents. Okay, um. So, you know, you have these documents as vectors in a vector space, okay? And, and w really what you want to do is you, you want to normalize the documents. So you want to, um, the, the way that people usually normalize document vectors is with the so-called L2 norm, okay? So that means you take the sum of every individual, you divide it, instead of dividing it by the sum, which would be an L1 norm, you divide it by the sum of squares. Okay, and when you do that, that means that the sum of squares of the vector will equal one. 
okay? And actually, if you go back to this statement, if you were to take L2 normalized vectors, their norms, these norms are by definition one. So once you once you L2 normalize, you actually just have to multiply this top part basically, and you get a zero on metrics, metric, okay? So usually people always normalize, L2 normalize stuff first so that they can just multiply them together, okay? The other cool thing is if, in, so a document is a vector, a series of documents, which is called a corpus, okay? So like the set of all Wikipedia articles is a corpus, that's a matrix, okay? And if you multiply, let me get this right. Yeah, if you multiply a matrix, similar uh, a vector represent, or sorry, a matrix representing a corpus, by its transpose, you get a matrix of similarities between every single document. Okay, as long as you get the transpose right. Okay, so that's kind of cool. You can do everything in, in like purely in terms of linear algebra. Okay. Um, okay, and then the other thing is uh, clustering. So you, you have these things in a vector space. Okay, and so so again we're gonna sorry sorry uh, David we're gonna we're gonna step into the actually the two dimensional space if you can imagine that. Um, and uh, so so think we have like a bunch of things. Uh, documents and it they're like projected in a two-dimensional space so intuitively humans we can see how things might cluster okay and that, that happens if you look at similar documents okay um but then in general you, you need to use an algorithm you can't just eyeball everything right so um so there's this various many many methods for clustering you can use one is called k-means clustering which minimizes the the average distance between um documents in a cluster so it tries to make the, the sort of the tightest clusters that you can given this a number k of clusters, okay, like five or 10, you just choose it x on a t and, and ask it to cluster it, okay? So that works pretty well. The, the problem is that you need to choose k beforehand. It's not always clear, like, what, what should that be, okay? So you need to kind of guess and check, but um, it works pretty well getting out like what you might intuitively think is, is reasonable, okay? So um, that's one thing. Um, machine learning, this is, this is kind of a preview, really. Uh, you can you can do stuff with like machine learning and text analysis are becoming increasingly convergent in some sense or like they're building on one another. So in addition to um, classifying text, uh, you can also if you t basically if you take a classifier and you, you you invert it, you can make a generator. Okay, um, and so you can generate like this 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 I just generated there's this thing called GPT two from OpenAI which is this like super monster. Uh, um, like a generator thing, um, like it generates text basically. So you take it and I, and I like trained it on Moby Dick and I had it generate like a synthetic like chapter from Moby Dick, which is not in Moby Dick at all, but like could plausibly be uh, in it. Um, so, I mean, it doesn't totally make sense, but like it, it's like, it, it kind of has that Moby Dick sort of feel. Okay, so um, you can do that too. There's a lot of like really, really cool stuff in machine learning and, and that's being developed now. Okay, um, I don't know what you would use this for. I mean, I guess what I'm saying is that like you can all, you could do classification stuff in machine learning. I've done some things classifying patents into different categories, like is it related to clean technology or something. And that's something where you can um, do it on. A, you can you can create a training set of, of like a few thousand patents that you just classify by hand. You train an algorithm, like a neural network, on that to to classify it based essentially on the document vectors, okay? And then you turn that loose on the set of all patents, of which there are about you know, six, to, six to seven million uh, nowadays, uh, which is not feasible to do by hand. You, you train that classifier on the set of all patents and, and basically extrapolate the, your, your training set out from there, okay? And there are methods of, from, of avoiding overfitting and everything like that. So I'll talk about that. That's like a preview. Um, like we read left to right, you could have the same words in a different order and have a different meaning. Um, Oh wait, the, does the flow of words matter? Yeah, I mean, so so that's the other thing that's cool about doing machine learning stuff is that you can you can go beyond you can go beyond bag of words. Okay, you can go beyond bag of words without machine learning. You can look at the first the first thing you should do is you know start at k equals and and one gram. So look at words and see what happens. And then if you need to start going to two and three grams, because then you can kind of pick up local order. Okay, then there's the question of long range ordering, which you even see here. I mean this this. This Moby Dick thing makes sense on a local level, but once you get from paragraph to paragraph, it stops being logically coherent. So um, the long range order stuff, that's more difficult. Co-occurrence of words in the same sentence, you could probably come up with metrics like that. 
once you start going down that road, though, you, you probably just want to use machine learning because there you can you can use classifiers that allow for long range dependencies. So you, there's this thing called a LSTM, which is which is basically it's kind of like it's it's more or less an ARN AR1 AR2 whatever um, where you have like an internal state that's that's kept that you calculate and so you like take a word you chop on the word you 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 analyze it and update your state and then you you output a guess for the next word and then you take another word so it's like if you see value function then in your internal state you're like oh this is an economist talking and they may say the word iteration next right and so you put a high probability on iteration being the next one right if you're predicting things so you get this this is like a it keeps an internal state that allows for long range dependencies because you might know that if you if you mention value function you know three sentences ago you're likely to mention you know policy function like you know a couple sentences later okay so you keep that state to, to have an idea of like what's happening over 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 a longer range um and that allows you to, to classify documents better. Okay, so that's that's uh, I mean, I it, I don't know that I mean I would call that um, an LSTM classifier or recursive neural network classifier. I think that the, the LSTM is specific recursive neural network. RNN is is more general. Okay, but it's essentially one that allows for long range dependencies. There's a couple different. There's many different types of RNNs out there, but LSTM is the most famous one. I would say. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're gonna talk about that. So we're gonna do that, basically. We're gonna make, we're gonna use a LSTM uh, classifiers. Maybe we'll look at some auto encoders and, and things like that, which is like a dimensionality reduction technique. Okay, so we'll do all of that, all right? So th this is like a preview of, of what you can do once you go into that machine learning space, okay? Um, okay, so then tools. Uh, so I'm, I'm basically out of time here, so I'll, I'll try and wrap up fairly soon. Um, Python, uh, SK Learn is a good thing. It's um, it's like data science going towards machine learning with some text analysis vectorization. That happens in SK Learn, okay. And we'll see that next time when I go through this notebook that I have. Uh, and then NLTK is a little bit more for like uh, linguistic lexical analysis type parts of speech analysis. That's more like the classical linguist stuff, but it can be useful as well, okay. Um, okay, so I have this example. I'm not. I guess I don't have time to, to launch it now. Um, but I'll I'll go through the working code example next time with with, with vectorization and stuff. Okay. Um, yeah. And with, with I this this I was showing some examples that I was doing. So so like my Wikipedia research, we use this. So we use document vectorization and, and, and similarity. Okay. Um, this will be the last thing I say. I think so in this lecture uh so uh what we do for wikipedia is we want to figure out how does wikipedia publication influence science and we we can see the history of wikipedia publications but we, we can't infer ca causality from that because when things get popular they show up in both wikipedia and science at the same time so uh what we do is get a we get we, we don't write we get a bunch of people to write articles in wikipedia and then we just randomly publish half of them okay and look at the difference that between published and non-published. Okay, so it's it's really an experimental thing, but the metric that we use is we look at similarities for science published right before the Wikipedia article, and then science published or like after plus a little lag, uh, the Wikipedia article. Right, we look at the distribution of similarities here and the distribution here. Okay, and we compare those two. Okay, so that's diff. That's like diff number one. We compare. We look at the difference between these distributions. Then we diff that again across treatment and control to get actually the, because you know the control could 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 change too in the positive direction. So we compare treatment and control. We get diff and diff. So it's a diff and diff, but essentially our metric is using document similarity like average and and, and distributional properties thereof on top of that. Okay, so so that's an example that I you know, I can speak to that. I, I I've done that. So, um, but that that's like a, a particular approach that you can take. Okay, so. Um, yeah, I, mean, I'll t I can talk about that more in, in more detail later on. Um, yeah, and I, I'm, do I'm doing another project where we're classif where we're trying to match up patents with the actual products that they correspond to. So that's more of a classification exercise. We actually also use Wikipedia there because I'm just obsessed with it. Um, but we'll see there. You, it, you can also do that like a kind of a classification thing as well. Okay. So um, yeah, I guess I'm at, yeah I'm out of time. Um, so let's let's pick this up next time.
all right, okay, I'm happy we got the ball rolling on, on text analysis. Okay, we're gonna dig deeper there, start looking at more code and, uh, and slowly amp up the machine learning component, I think, uh, over time, okay? And then and then also next time we'll, we'll talk about more of it, a little, some more implementation details probably on the on this uh, battle royale that we've uh, we've set up for ourselves. Okay, so um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. <laughs>